You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello and Happy New Year. Welcome to episode 319 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. We all know the story of how in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue and found himself in the Caribbean. Now, one of the islands that Columbus stopped at during his first voyage across the Atlantic was the alligator-shaped island that sits right at the opening of the Gulf of Mexico and approximately 90 miles from the Florida shoreline. This island is, of course, the island of Cuba. Now, what do we know about this island that the Spanish described as the key to the Indies? What kind of relationship and exchange did early Cuba have with British North America and the early United States? These are some of the questions that we'll be asking in this episode. As Ada Ferrer, a professor of history and Latin American and Caribbean studies at New York University, joins us to investigate the early history of Cuba with details from her book, Cuba, and American History. Now, during our investigation, Otter reveals what Cuba was like before the arrival of Christopher Columbus and the Spanish, why the Spanish and other European empires considered Cuba to be the key to the West Indies, and details about early Cuba's relationship with British North America and the early United States, including details about Cuba's role in the American Revolution. But first, Happy New Year! We have made it to a new calendar year, and there's reason to be excited. The Omohundro Institute's digital audio team and I have planned an exciting first quarter of episodes, and we're in the process of planning many more. This year, you can expect to hear episodes that you've been requesting, like an episode about Masonic lodges and masons in early America, as well as special episodes about what it was like to experience and live through the War for American Independence. So really, I just wanted to take this moment to get you excited about Ben Franklin's world in 2022, and to thank you for listening and for choosing to spend your time with us. All right, are you ready for our trip to early Cuba? Let's get to it. Our guest is the Julius Silver Professor of History and Latin American and Caribbean Studies at New York University. Her research specialties are in the history of Cuba, comparative slavery, and revolution. She's the author of numerous books, including her most recent book, Cuba, an American History. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Otter Ferrer. Thanks for having me, Liz. Great to be here. Now, I think we should start our conversation by talking a bit about Cuba. Cuba is this 42,000 square foot mile alligator shaped island located not far from the North American mainland in the Atlantic Ocean. And to give you a sense of Cuba's geography, we're talking about an island that has lowland plains covering about two thirds of it and high mountains and rolling hills covering the other third of the island. So, Ada, now that we have a sense of Cuba's location and geography, I wonder if you could tell us what this island was like before Europeans arrived. You know, who lived there and what their life was like before they came in contact with Europeans? Well, we know a lot from the work of archaeologists and historians and other scholars, but of course, we don't know as much as we'd like to know. The island was inhabited by people who came to be known as Tainos. We don't know what they called themselves, but Europeans did call them Tainos. And there was another group further to the west that Cubans came to call Sibone. The group that we know most about are the Tainos because they left more of an archaeological record and because they're the ones who bore the brunt of Spanish conquest. So there's more evidence about their lives and their life ways. The Taino had settled villages. They had political structures and hierarchies. They had ingenious forms of agriculture that tried to make good, effective use of limited land. And they had a vibrant culture with, obviously, religious beliefs, games, music, etc. And one of the things that people often don't realize is how alive 
their legacy still is. So, for example, in language, their language left all these words that we use every day without realizing it. The English word hurricane comes from the Spanish huracán, which comes from a Taino word because Spaniards didn't know hurricanes in Europe. The same thing for sharks, the armchairs that the political leader sat in, the word that Cubans used for that is butaca. That's a Taino word. There's hundreds of others like that. Same thing with musical instruments that are still played today in Caribbean and Latin American music. And they were the ones who Columbus and Spanish settlers first encountered. That's really interesting to hear because when we read about the Taino people, we often get the impression that when Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World, he and the Spaniards obliterated the Taino populations with disease and enslavement. And while we know that certainly did happen, the way we often read and hear about it is that the Taino people and all of their culture just disappeared. All the peoples just disappeared. But it really sounds like from the way you describe it, that both the Taino and their culture continue to exist today. Yeah, I mean, obviously there was genocide. The majority did not survive, either from the spread of new contagious diseases or from overwork, from war, because there was war between the Spanish and the indigenous people. So all those things took a toll that was irreversible on the native population. But even genocide leaves survivors. And there were people who survived. They often survived by going into the mountains and trying to hide from the Spanish. So there were communities that were able to survive. There was also intermixture after the Spanish came and so on. So the population was, you know, by and large killed, but obviously not every indigenous person died and they tried to survive as best they could. Now, what happened in Cuba when Christopher Columbus and his ships arrived in 1492? Because Cuba is one of the islands that Columbus and his men actually stop at. It's not just that he arrives in the New World in 1492. He actually stops at Hispaniola and the island of Cuba. So could you tell us what this moment of contact was like? Because when we talk about contact in the North American mainland situation, we find that Europeans had been around Atlantic shores and interacting with indigenous peoples there for quite some time before we actually see the French and the Dutch and the English and even the Spanish colonize in North America. But when we're talking about 1492, we really are talking about a first encounter here. So how did the Taino experience this moment? Yeah, well, we know the Taino experience of what Columbus did, from mostly from the accounts of Columbus and some of his men or priests he appointed to take records. So it's a one-sided account. According to Columbus, you know, the people came with gifts and sometimes they ran away in terror. He landed first in Cuba in October of 1492, after having landed first in, in the Bahamas. And he stayed for about three weeks, mostly looking for gold and other treasure. And people on the island kept telling him, no, that the gold was elsewhere. And so that's when he went to the island that he called Hispaniola, which is today Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So there's no European settlement that begins in Cuba in 1492. The first Spanish colonization and settlement comes in Hispaniola. But by 1511, the Spanish crown appoints a governor and begins significant Spanish settlement in Cuba. And so that happens in the second decade of the 16th century. By the time the Spanish do that, you know, they've been in the islands for over 20 years or about 20 years. And Native people know the history. They know what happens when the Spanish come and start forcing indigenous people to mine gold and bring their diseases and so on. So you get a lot of Native resistance to Spanish colonization. I'd like to linger on this really important point you just made, which is how we know what we know about this moment of initial contact between Columbus and the Taino people of Cuba. You said that a lot of the information we have about this moment of contact comes directly from Columbus and the priests who sailed with him. But as you mentioned, this is a really one-sided view of the encounter. Is there any way for historians to verify the information in those accounts? Especially because Columbus was a really well-known embellisher. He often wrote accounts to the Spanish crown 
you know, talking himself and everything that he was doing up. Everything's fine. Everything's dandy. I found all these riches when he really hadn't. So is there any way to verify these accounts from Columbus so we can get past the embellishment and to what actually happened? Right. No, and he kept saying, obviously, that he had discovered, even when he died, he was saying he was in Japan. So we obviously can't take him at his word. You know, some of the priests he appointed, for example, in Hispaniola, there was a man named Fray Pane, or Pane, I can't remember now, but it has an accent. And, you know, he recorded indigenous belief systems, indigenous culture as best he could make it out, and also recorded aspects of native language. So there were priests who wanted to understand these cultures in part largely to convert them to Christianity. One of the main sources that we have for the colonization of Cuba comes from the account of Bartolomé de las Casas, who's a priest who began actually as a Spanish settler and as an encomendero, meaning he had land and he had indigenous people who worked for him. And he became aware of the deep level of exploitation and the fact that that exploitation was actually an impediment to Christianization and to good, right? So he gave up his land and the people that had been commended to him. And he became a priest and he became the most vocal critic of Spanish conquest and colonization in the Americas. So his book is called The Account of the Destruction of the Indies, which tells you everything. That's what he wants to narrate, the destruction. And it was translated in English with titles like The Tears and Suffering of the Indians. It became one of the primary sources of the Black legend, the condemnation of Spanish cruelty in the conquest. So obviously, you know, he had an agenda and that colors what he writes. But he also was there and observing things. And from the demographic record and the demographic collapse from other sources that substantiate some of what he says. So, for example, he talks about overwork and suffering, and then you have Spanish officials and Spanish landholders who are talking about indigenous people committing suicide by eating dirt. And, you know, they talk about torture. So we know that that happened. One of the most interesting stories, if I can go on a little longer, one of the most interesting stories that Las Casas tells is of an indigenous leader named Atuey. And Atuey is a, an important cultural figure today, a symbol of resistance. There are monuments to him in Cuba. His uh, profile appears on labels for beers and soft drinks. So he's very well known. And the story goes that he had been a leader in Hispaniola and he fled the Spanish by going to Cuba, which was very close. You could, you know, navigate on canoes to eastern Cuba. And he did that. And he gathered his people and said, the Spanish are coming. And they're coming because they venerate this God and their God is gold. If we want to get rid of the Spanish, we have to get rid of the gold. So he throws all the gold in a basket, puts the gold in a basket, throws it in a river. But of course, that doesn't deter the Spanish and they come and they capture him. And the famous story is that when they capture him and tie him to a stake to burn him alive, a priest comes up to him holding the Bible and asks him to accept the word of God so that he can ascend to heaven. And Atue says, well, are the Spanish in heaven? And the priest says, the good ones are. And then he says, that's okay, I'll go to hell. So we don't know if every word of that story is true, but there was a figure named Atue. He would have been at war with the Spanish. They would have executed him in that manner. So, you know, it's a plausible story, even if we can't verify every syllable of Atue's speech. I call it the first political speech on Cuban territory, perhaps. <laughs> I know we want to talk more about Spanish colonization and the more modern state of Cuba, but you mentioned that Hatue flees the Spanish people in Hispaniola by taking a canoe and going to Cuba. And we know from speaking with other scholars like Drew Lippmann that indigenous peoples really valued water and were very adept at using the life and currents of water to live and to travel. So what was the relationship of the Taino people with water? And were they really capable of visiting all sorts of different Caribbean islands, you know, with watercraft like canoes? If you look at a map of the Caribbean, there's a chain that goes from South America and it bends around and it goes to the islands that are called the Greater Antilles, which are Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, Cuba and Jamaica. 
And indigenous people first arrived in Cuba by that means, by water coming up along the chain. So there's a long history that, you know, that predates Christopher Columbus for centuries. The canoes were an indigenous vessel. The Spanish had never seen them before. So when they arrive in the islands and people start coming out in canoes to greet them, they don't have a word for it. So they actually try to describe what a canoe is. But yes, they moved around for fishing to spread news to conquer. So, the, you know, the Caribs were coming up along that chain. So that's another form of contact and movement, which was warfare. Thanks for that. You mentioned earlier that in 1511, the Spanish decided to establish a permanent colony in Cuba. What exactly was it about Cuba that attracted the Spanish? You know, what advantages did the Spanish hope to receive from establishing a colony on Cuba? Well, part of it comes from the fact that they've already been in Hispaniola for about 20 years, and there's already been a demographic collapse in Hispaniola. So already the Spanish were mounting slaving expeditions to get indigenous people from surrounding islands back to Hispaniola. So the attraction is multiple. They want to go to a place where the indigenous population is not yet so in decline. They want to go to a place where they can look for more gold. And they want to expand Spanish territory and Spanish and Christian rule. So that's the attraction of Cuba. And what kind of colony did the Spanish establish in Cuba? Was this supposed to be primarily an agricultural colony? Or was this colony really supposed to be about trade and other sorts of commercial activity? Yeah, well, initially, the Spanish focused on mining. So they're looking for gold. They're looking for silver. They don't plant the crops. They get indigenous people to plant crops. But the goal is mineral wealth above all. Now, that doesn't work out too well because Cuba doesn't have abundant gold or silver. It has alluvial deposits, other things, but it wasn't a major fine there. So one of the things that happens pretty early on is that, you know, the Spanish could go into one place and then using it as a base to explore another place. And at the end of that first decade, you get people beginning to go to Mexico. And of course, the most famous is Hernán Cortés, who had been in eastern Cuba as an encomendero and landholder and commanding Indian Taino labor. And he sets off on illegal expedition to what is Mexico and, of course, comes across the Aztec Empire and much gold and silver. And he tells that tale and he lets people know you can come. As soon as this is pacified, you can come and you know, he says, you will get Indians and you will make great wealth. So the Spaniards in Cuba immediately begin leaving. And the Spanish try to keep people from leaving by making laws and making it punishable by death and expropriation of property, etc. But they leave. So they go to Mexico first. Some of them go to Florida when that settlement begins. And then later they'll go to Central America, Panama, and down into the Indian area where, of course, the Inca Empire exists. So Cuba gets, in some sense, relatively depopulated early on because of the settlements and the discoveries in South America. And at that point, Cuba begins to become less a classic settler colony than a hub. It becomes the place where ships stop to stock up before they go on to, you know, to Spain bearing all the gold and silver. And so it becomes a kind of a commercial place that's oriented outwards. It receives sailors. You know, some winters, like dozens of ships spend the season there waiting for weather to cross the Atlantic Ocean. And so everything, especially in Havana, and Havana sits where the Gulf Stream kind of gathers. And that was discovered kind of by accident by a Spanish sailor. His name was Alominos. He was taking the first shipment of Mexican treasure back to Spain. He remembered that strange stream by Cuba. And so he goes to the northern point of the island where Havana now is. And from there, he follows the Gulf Stream, you know, through the Bahamas up along the eastern seaboard of the U.S. to about the Carolinas and then over to Europe with the wind. So the fact that Havana sits in that very propitious spot means that that's going to become the pattern. Ships are going to winter there. They're going to be holding massive treasures, silver flows like a river, and it gets that reputation as the key to the Indies, the key to the New World, 
So it becomes important for that reason, less about its own agriculture or its own mineral wealth, but for the role it plays in the Spanish empire, which at that point is dependent on minerals from gold and silver. So Cuba really played a key role as a transportation hub in the Caribbean, as a place where Spain's treasure fleet could gather from Mexico and stock up on supplies before it went across the Atlantic Ocean to deliver up its treasure. And also as a place where people could kind of get the lay of the land and figure out whether they wanted to move to a different Caribbean island or somewhere on the mainland of the Americas. Now, In episode 139, we spoke with Andres Cercendez, who told us all about indigenous slavery that was happening at the hands of the Spanish, where the Spanish enslaved indigenous peoples to work their gold and silver mines in Mexico and Peru. You mentioned that the Spanish really had kind of a labor shortage in the Caribbean. And I'm wondering, did they ever take Cuba's Taino people to Mexico or even to Peru so that they could work their gold and silver mines there? I mean, there might have been some that were taken, but it wasn't a general pattern. And usually the Spanish left a place after the indigenous population was already in decline in that place, thinking that it wouldn't be where they were going. You know, there might have been a few, but it wasn't a general pattern. So what we're really seeing here is Spaniards moving to and from different islands of the Caribbean and areas of the Americas, not necessarily indigenous peoples. To the New World, yes, African enslaved people are there in Cuba from the first voyage. It's not full scale plantation slavery, as, as we'll see later. You may have had some Taino people accompanying them, perhaps as translators. That also became a thing, and some Africans. But by and large, when I talk about you know people leaving Cuba to go to Mexico, it's by and large the Spanish settler community. Cuba served as an important transportation hub in the Caribbean. But how else does this island fit within the larger world of the Atlantic economy that really develops between the 17th and 18th centuries? Because you have mainland America, Europe, Africa, and different Caribbean islands all trading with each other. You know, they're trading goods, they're trading people, they're trading ideas. What role did Cuba play in this larger set of exchanges? It plays an enormous role, and that's why you know, it comes to be called the key to the Indies. When the Spanish king gives Havana a seal, it's the key because that was its role. Spain in the 16th century and into the 17th was a major power, a wealthy power. Other European empires wanted to kind of get in on the lucrative business of New World conquest and colonization. And Cuba became a linchpin because it became the place where all that wealth was gathered, where people went for crossing to the new world. So basically, Havana and Cuba became a target. So as the British and the French are trying to get in on Spanish wealth as pirates are patrolling the Mediterranean Sea, they soon realize it's much better to go hang out in the Caribbean because there's no forts, there's fewer Spanish forces, and there's all this silver and gold. And because Havana becomes the place where, you know, sometimes there'd be 30 or 40 ships, all with massive shipments of gold and silver. So everyone wanted to attack Havana. Everyone wanted Havana for themselves. So it played that kind of role. We see that kind of European covetousness of Havana, you know, play out in the 18th century when the British attack. I'm glad you raised Cuba's history with pirates because there was a major pirate attack on Havana in 1555 that I'd like us to talk about. So, Ada, would you tell us about this attack by pirates and about who these pirates were? So there had been attacks before, but the 1555 one was the first one that was documented significantly and that we know about. The pirates were French. They were French Protestants, and they came in and basically raised Havana to the ground. They burned every building in the city except for, I think, a hospital, a church, and the place that they used as their own headquarters. They expected to make more money than they did, but when they arrived, you know, the treasure fleet had sailed. There was not much silver in the city, and so that was their retaliation. To burn the city, they took African captives and slave people captives and hanged them in public. But that attack also, it stepped up Spanish protection of its new world. Well, so it began, for example, instead of appointing 
lawyers as governors that began appointing military men as governors. They established campaigns to get rid of the French along the Florida coast so that there would be fewer local threats. They began shipping the treasure in fleets. So rather than ships crossing individually, they had to cross all together, escorted by armed vessels, so therefore the term armada. So the attack caused Spain to realize the importance of Havana and to step up its military presence, its fortifications. The building of fortifications took off as a result, and those fortifications still exist today. They're beautiful structures that guard the entrance to the Bay of Havana. They were built by African slaves. It's at that point that you begin to get more direct vessels from the African coast to Cuba in the later 1500s, 1550s, 1570s. This 1555 pirate attack sounds really transformative. And just so we can get a better picture of it in our minds, are we talking about a couple of French pirate ships, you know, sitting out in the Bay of Havana, bombarding the city with cannonballs from the harbor? Or are we actually talking about pirates making landfall and setting things ablaze as they ransack the town looking for treasure? Well, they do make landfall. So they kind of sail a little past Havana and then disembark, not in the city, and then they march overland. So I think if I remember correctly, it was about 200. And they do fight in the streets. In a small village outside Havana, they took some African captives and asked for ransom. When the ransom didn't come, they executed them and left their bodies. We don't know the names of those people who died. They went into churches and performed all kinds of sacrilege. They took the priest robes and wore them around the city as they marched. They took treasures from churches and so on. So it was a pretty memorable event. Colonial Havana was really known to have quite the garrison, which was put in place to protect its harbor, because as you mentioned, this is where the Spanish treasure fleet from Mexico stops to resupply before it goes off across the Atlantic to Spain. It sounds like Spain really didn't start to build this garrison until after this 1555 pirate attack. So was there anyone in Havana to really defend the town when the pirates attacked? You know, was there a citizen militia that turned out? Was that all there was to turn out? The garrison was established later. So, you know, when it happens, the governor calls on citizens to come out and defend the city. And it's partly in response to these attacks and to the threat of attack that you get this profound militarization of Havana in its aftermath. To move our story forward just a bit, after the 1555 pirate attack, as you mentioned, Ada, Spain does become quite serious about defending Havana and its harbor from future attacks. Could you tell us about the garrison and the fortifications that were built in Havana to protect it after the 1555 attack? You mentioned earlier that we can still see these fortifications and they're quite beautiful. So could you describe them for us? I wish I could show you a picture or show your your listeners a picture. They are really beautiful. You know, they're massive stone structures with lookouts and places to put cannons and to fire. And basically, if you look at a map of Havana, it's a huge harbor and very, very deep. So basically, what they did is they put forts on either side of the entrance to Havana. So they would guard the entrance. Sometimes they would put boom chains between the two forts to keep ships from coming in. But, you know, there's some of the oldest forts in the hemisphere and beautiful. They also had them in eastern Cuba. So we don't want to only talk about Havana. The city of Santiago was the first capital on the southeastern shore of the island. And in some ways, because Havana was the site of the treasure fleet, it had all these connections to Spain. Santiago was more removed from that. And as the French and British started colonizing other islands in the Caribbean, the eastern city of Santiago was very oriented to the Caribbean and traded illegally with the French, with the British and so on. And there was a beautiful fort there built a little bit later. Thank you for that description. And I think it's going to come in quite handy now because, as you mentioned earlier, Havana was attacked again during the 1760s, and this time by the British during the Seven Years of French and Indian War. Why did the British attack Havana? And what was the attraction of Cuba for the British? Because it's not like the British had discovered a place like Mexico that's full of gold and 
has its own treasure fleets to send across the Atlantic. You know, as I said before, every European monarch wants Havana. It's associated with wealth, with the presence of silver and gold. And also they realize that it has other value. And the value comes in part from its location. So Havana is situated at the intersection of the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico. So you could almost see it as kind of a barrier, a guard for that whole world. It commands a privileged post in those three waterways. So it can be useful for protecting, you know, the southern part of North America, for protecting Mexico as a gateway to South America, et cetera. So it has that privileged location. The other thing is that by then, you know, England and France are major colonial powers in the New World. And in some sense, they've surpassed the Spanish. And they've done that not by mining for gold and silver, but by developing agriculture, commercial agriculture tropical agriculture for export. So there are major economies built around the cultivation of sugar and the cultivation of tobacco and the cultivation of coffee. And the French and the English realize that Cuba has that potential. Slavery already existed there. Sugar was already being cultivated, but not at anywhere near the level that you already saw in islands like first Barbados or later Jamaica, French Saint-Domingue. So they also saw the value of Cuba for that. And so the British attack in 1762, as you say, towards the end of the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, and it's a major event, not just in Cuban history, but in Atlantic history. The siege lasts for weeks. The Spanish resist. By then, there are Spanish garrison, but you also have colonial militias, including a black militia. And they managed to resist. And it's only after the arrival of forces from the 13 colonies, from places like Connecticut and Rhode Island and so on, that the British are able to attack one of these forts and take it and then attack the other side of the bay in Havana. And so they defeat the Spanish. The Spanish relinquish Havana to Britain. And then Britain occupies it for 10 months. And A few things happen in those 10 months. One is that they open up trade. So gone are the Spanish trade monopolies. And so North American merchants in particular descend on Havana with all kinds of, with flour, with raccoon hats, with, you know, whatever it is they want to sell. And they go there to buy lumber and to buy sugar. So that trade between the 30 colonies in Cuba kind of booms in the aftermath of the siege. The other thing that the British do is that they open up the slave trade. So before this, the Spanish had a monopoly arrangement in the slave trade where one company was given license to sell African captives. The British eliminate that. And even before the surrender, there's a slave ship in the harbor waiting to unload and sell its cargo. So during those 10 months, the slave trade takes off, sugar takes off, and trade with North America takes off. So it's a pivotal moment for a Cuban elite that confirms that they want trade with North America. And it's a pivotal moment for those North American merchants who who already know the value of Cuba and want to extend and continue those links. Wow, that's a lot of economic development to take place in 10 months. What happened to Cuba and all of this economic development that happened rather quite quickly, but sounds like It happened quickly because the Cubans were really excited about it. What happens to Cuba and Cubans after the Spanish regained control of the island during the peace settlement of the Seven Years' War? Did Spain ever attempt to, you know, reclose the doors on some of the trade and economic opportunities that Great Britain had opened? You know, so they leave in 1763 and several things. One, the garrisoning and militarization of Havana accelerates again. So that's one thing that happens. The other thing is that the elite, you know, has gained this experience of free trade, of vibrant, if that's the word you want to use, slave trade. So they get better at lobbying the Spanish for that. And, you know, the Spanish themselves are engaged in reforms in this point, you know, the Bourbon reforms that try to recalibrate the colonial and imperial relationship to make it more profitable for Spain. And they're willing to consider other kinds of wealth and mineral wealth. So the Spanish also is wanting to continue some of the policies that the British 
had instituted. And then, of course, that's going to get even more power with the French and Haitian revolutions. And speaking of revolutions, within 12 years of the conclusion of the Seven Years' War, which ended in 1763, the American Revolution breaks out on the North American mainland. And as we know, the American revolutionaries, they need foreign assistance to help carry out their cause, which eventually is independence. And two of the countries that they single out for aid are France and Spain. And that's because both of those countries had lost to the British during the Seven Years' War. So they kind of framed the American Revolution as a chance to get back at Great Britain for that massive defeat. Now, France, and to a similar extent, Spain, do respond to some of these requests for aid by providing covert aid to the revolutionaries. And they largely send this aid through their Caribbean colonies to North America. Now, Otto, we need to take a moment to talk about our episode's sponsor. When we get back, I'd really love to have a conversation about the role that Cuba may have played in providing this covert Spanish aid to the Americans, or just aid in general to the American Revolution. Hi, I'm Christine Walker. I'm a scholar of early America and the Atlantic world. And my new book, Jamaica Ladies, Female Slaveholders and the Creation of Britain's Atlantic Empire, published by the Omohundro Institute, is out now. Jamaica Ladies introduces a new cast of characters to what we think of as a very well-known story. It shows that a diverse group of women were every bit as involved in slaveholding as the more elite and famous men that we know about. Identifying the contributions of thousands of ordinary women to the expansion of chattel slavery raises all sorts of new questions about complicity, power, race, gender, and violence. Questions that we're only really beginning to answer. Get your copy of Jamaica Ladies, Female Slaveholders, and the Creation of Britain's Atlantic Empire wherever you buy books. To order a copy of Christine Walker's award-winning book, Jamaica Ladies, Female Slaveholders and the Creation of Britain's Atlantic Empire, at a 40% discount, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Jamaica. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Jamaica and use promo code 01BFW. Ada, did Cuba send aid or help Spain send covert aid to the American revolutionaries during the American Revolution? Yes, quite a bit. I mean, some of it wasn't even clandestine. So when the Americans appeal to France and Spain, Spain agrees that part of the aid it will give is basically opening up Havana to the revolutionaries. So Spain itself allows that to happen. And then merchants on the ground in Cuba take enormous advantage of that. So I should say there was a Cuban slave trader named Juan de Miralles, Spanish-born, but he'd been on the island for a while and had married into a rich Cuban family. He kind of becomes Spain's spy to the American Revolution and goes first to Charleston and up to Philadelphia, develops relationships with people like Robert Morris and Alexander Hamilton and George Washington. And people, you know, scholars have said that Mirayas working with Morris almost set up a private shipping channel between Havana and Philadelphia. Also Baltimore. Baltimore is sending so much flour to the U.S. And then the other thing that Spain does, it allows the revolutionaries to collect silver at Havana. So, you know, Havana has the subsidy that comes from Mexican silver, and Spain authorizes payments of that subsidy to the North Americans. So there's direct aid. Shortly before the Battle of Yorktown, when things are going badly and Washington doesn't have money to pay his troops, there's a French man who's trying to collect money and funds in Saint-Domingue to deliver to the New World. But there's no money in San Domingue at that point. And so they go off to Havana to get money. And the story goes that people contributed what they had. You know, women gave their duels and that money then arrived. And, you know, George Washington saw the French fleet arriving with assistance and was relieved. So people have talked about that Cuban assistance to the Washington for the Battle of Yorktown. Did Great Britain ever think about retaliating against Havana and Cuba for their assisting the American colonists? The Spanish were rightfully fearful of the British. I mean, it wasn't that long after the Seven Years' War 
for the American revolutionaries, the issue was independence of the war against Britain. For Spain, it was much more. So Spain participated not because it wanted to help the American revolutionaries. Actually, they didn't really want to help the American revolutionaries because they worried what kind of precedent it would set for their own colonies. So they were very worried about that, but they saw it as an opportunity to regain territory they had lost. So they wanted Jamaica back. They wanted Gibraltar back. They wanted to protect their territory in the Mississippi River area, right? So they did it more for that reason. And of course, in the end, it didn't work out. They didn't get anything. They never got to make it back to Gibraltar. And it did set a precedent, which is what they have done. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that precedent because it's really not long after the American Revolution. I mean, it happens starting in the late 18th century that we start to see all sorts of revolutions and movements for colonial independence erupt in the Caribbean and in Spanish colonies in the Americas. When we consider this age of revolutions, which is what historians call it, how should we think about Cuba fitting into this age? Did Cubans also work to achieve their independence from Spain and independence for Cuba? No. So all of South America becomes independent during the age of revolution, all of them by the mid-1820s. Cuba does not. Puerto Rico does not. And it's a really important deviation from that norm. Actually, it's a kind of crucial question and central concern in Cuban history. Why didn't Cuba become independent then? And the answer has to do with the American Revolution. It has more to do with the French and Haitian Revolution. So during the American Revolution and during the British occupation, the Cuban elite had seen what could come of a commercial connection to the U.S. So they wanted that, which would make you think, well, then they did want independence, right? And if it had been only that, they would have wanted independence. But the other thing that happens in Cuba in this period is that the Haitian Revolution changes the course in a sense of Cuban history. Cuba was already a society with slaves. It already had sugar, but it wasn't a major slaveholding or sugar colony. When the Haitian Revolution happens in Saint-Domingue, Saint-Domingue, as you know, was the wealthiest colony on the globe, the largest producer of sugar in the world. When that happens and the Cuban elite sees that, they say, this is our chance. Our hour of happiness has arrived. And they appeal to the Spanish crown for all these concessions. They say, we can take their place. We can become the new saint Domingue. So the king authorizes the freeing of the slave trade. No more monopoly. The king reduces taxes on sugar equipment and the export of sugar and so on. So it's in that period, after the Haitian Revolution, that sugar and slavery take definitive root in Cuba. Then Cuba by the 1820s is the largest producer of sugar in the world. It's one of the major destinations of African captives. And it becomes, when you think of a modern sugar plantation and a plantation system, that's what it becomes in the 19th century as a result of the Haitian Revolution. And what that means is that the Cuban elite, they're in that moment gaining ground. Spain is giving in to them. Spain is handing them concessions, in part because they don't want them to rebel. So the elite's in a sweet spot right there. And they're also fearful that if they try for independence, if they unleash a war, that you might get something like the Haitian Revolution. So they prefer to kind of protect slavery, protect sugar, and not risk any kind of social upheaval. And that's one of the major reasons that's given for Cuba deviating from the Spanish-American norm and not opting for independence. Both the profits and the power they were acquiring at that moment and the fear that it could all be lost through a social revolution among the enslaved. It sounds like the elite of Cuba were making all of the decisions, but I wonder how non-elite Cubans felt about the elite's decision to expand slavery, to expand agricultural production, and to remain part of the Spanish empire. You know, was there ever a moment where Enslaved Cubans looked at what was going on in San Domingue, which was one of the world's most successful slave uprisings, and say to themselves, I think now's our time, this age of revolutions, I think now's our time to step up and take our freedom? Or did non-elite free Cubans see what was going on around them and think, you know, we should stage a social revolution because it may grant us 
more political and economic power and more opportunities than we have now. Was there any segment of Cuban society during this age of revolutions thinking about staging a revolution? It's a fascinating question. And enslaved people in Cuba definitely saw what was going on in San Domingue. And you actually get a really noticeable increase in the frequency of rebellions and conspiracies in the aftermath of the Haitian Revolution. I mean, every year there were rebellions, and some years there were many, 1795, 1811, 1812, 1798. And the records from those conspiracies and rebellions are incredible. The Spanish always bring in witnesses to figure out what's going on, and the witnesses are enslaved people, and what they mostly recount is conversations among themselves. So they'll say, well, he asked me to join this, and he said that this person had already joined. We were doing it because we couldn't take it anymore. And there are these fascinating glimpses into the internal discussions among the enslaved. And one of the things that comes up in those discussions is the example of Haiti. So they talk about Santo Domingo. They don't call it Haiti yet. It hasn't, you know, they use the Spanish word for Santo Domingo. And they say, well, they weren't afraid. They fought with rocks and they became masters of the land. They became masters of themselves. We have to do what they did. And they would refer to certain Haitian leaders by name, Toussaint, Jean-Francois, et cetera. So it definitely had an impact. And it was an impact that was both intellectual and imaginative, but also political and military because they tried to organize against slavery. The other group that it had a real impact on was for free people of color. So Cuba had a significant population of free people of color. That is people who had acquired their freedom through self-purchase or manumission and the descendants of people who had acquired their freedom. And they also engaged in conspiracies and rebellions against slavery and against the Spanish state. But one of the things that we should be careful about, and people have written about this and talked about this in relation to South America generally, is that we can't assume that all those wars that became wars of independence began with the goal of independence in mind. So a lot of the struggles in South America were really against the French because the French had usurped the Spanish throne. And so they were rebelling against what they saw as an illegitimate state because it was French. And they were doing so in defense of their king, right, the Spanish king that had been deposed. So in terms of popular non-elite sentiment, it wasn't necessarily anti-Spanish. It was very much anti-French. To move a bit further into the 19th century, One interesting bit of history that Otta raises in her book, Cuba and American History, is that there was talk at one point of Cuba becoming a state within the United States. Otta, could you tell us about how Cuba almost became part of the United States and about the larger relationship Cuba had with the early United States? I think that's one of the most fascinating. It's not an episode because it's a long history in the book, and I pay quite a bit of attention to it. So the American founders were always interested in Cuba. So Thomas Jefferson from the beginning said, if I could draw the ideal map of the United States, it would include Canada to the north and Cuba to the south. And John Adams also believed that Cuba would one day be American. And you read these people like Adams and Jefferson and Monroe and Madison, even Calhoun, you know, talking about Cuba as a part of the U.S., vital to the interests of the U.S., that its acquisition is vital to the interests of the U.S. And it's a little perplexing, in part because it didn't happen. And so why would they think Cuba was so important? Initially, it's the question of geography and territory, right? The, the precise location where Cuba sits, as I mentioned before, at that intersection of the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic and Caribbean Sea. If you look at a map, you can see that the city of Havana is almost, not quite, but it's very close to the port of New Orleans. New Orleans is becoming a major port. By then, all the produce produced in the Mississippi River Valley, all that wheat, corn, all the food is coming through that port and up to North America, to Europe, to South America. So if you look at a map, as the founders did, they came to believe that whoever controlled Cuba might have the power to cripple American commerce. Whoever controlled Cuba could blockade the port of New Orleans, which would have a major effect on the new republic's commerce and economy. So that was one reason. But the other reason is that Americans increasingly have more 
investment and more of a stake in the Cuban economy. So sugar and slavery really take root in Cuba in the 19th century. You have more American investment in both those things. So you have more American sugar planters. You have Americans buying up plantations. You have American slave traders engaging in the slave trade between Africa and Cuba. And one of those slave traders was an American senator, James DeWolf, who engaged in the slave trade to Cuba. And he was senator from Rhode Island. And his family also owned four plantations on the island. You have more people like that who are investing in Cuba. You have most of the slave ships that are arriving in Cuba with captives are built in Baltimore. The sugar equipment is built in the U.S. The engineers who run the sugar equipment go seasonally from the U.S. to work. So the two systems become very linked. So that gives the U.S. an interest in protecting it. And what men like Adams and Monroe and others decided was that as long as Cuba remained Spanish and Spain was weak, it would be fine because they could continue to invest and they could handle it. What they worried was that the British would come in and take Cuba. By this point, Britain is a major force against the transatlantic slave trade. Abolitionism is, you know, a major force in British society. And so the Americans are worried that the British are going to come in, take Cuba, and then end the slave trade and eventually slavery. And they worried about the implication of that for their own slave system. And so slavery is the glue, in a sense, for a lot of the 19th century. What Americans who wanted to acquire Cuba wanted was to acquire it as multiple slave states, right? So white Southerners began organizing expeditions to liberate Cuba from Spain and annex it to the U.S. And the idea was that it would be three slave states, and that would increase the power of slavery in the U.S., in the Congress, in the Senate, and so on. So that's what the interest was about as well. So given the Southern interest and really just the slave interest in adding Cuba to the United States, did the briefly lived Confederate states of America ever attempt to lure Cuba away from Spain and into its orbit as three Confederate states of America? Yes, absolutely. So the Confederate states sent emissaries to Cuba to negotiate with Spain. Spain wouldn't recognize it as a state, but it did recognize it as a belligerent and it gave it access to its ports. So Confederates traded in Cuba. They bought weapons there. They engaged in other commerce. And when they lost the Civil War, many of them initially traveled to Cuba to kind of lick their wounds and imagine being able to live in a place that still had slavery. And a few of them bought plantations at that point and held people as slaves. Some people tried to escape with their enslaved people from the U.S. to the South or to sell them there. So that was a major factor. When we think of Cuba today, I think many of us here in the United States would naturally bring to mind that long embargo that once existed between the United States and Cuba. But I think one thing we can really gain from our conversation today is that when you look back at the long history between these two countries, what we really see is a long history of a shared and pretty close relationship between the United States and Cuba. There were always close connections. The connection was never equal or even. So, I mean, I don't know how far forward you want to go, but there were close economic relations, close cultural relations. American culture was very well known in Cuba. Cuban culture was actually well known in the U.S., especially in the 20th century before the revolution. But one of the things that becomes clear throughout the 19th century, and then especially in the 20th century, is that American investment in Cuba ends up coming at the expense of Cuban investment in Cuba. And that's going to become really clear at the end of the 19th century. Cubans do finally begin a war of independence in 1868. It's called the Ten Years' War. The rebels ended slavery in rebel territory, but they lost the war. Then you have two other wars. So basically, the whole period of Cuban independence, of the struggle for Cuban independence, is a 30-year period from 1868 to 1898. In that period, you get the rise of a multiracial army that includes enslaved or formerly enslaved people. You get the rise of black officers, black generals. So it's an interesting, important force to come out of a society where slavery ended only in 1886. 
you also have the rise of a language and discourse of anti-racism and anti-discrimination. Again, interesting to come out of in the recent slave society. So that movement is active over those 30 years. The Americans intervene only at the very end of that process in 1898, after the explosion of the Maine. And that's what we know of as the Spanish-American War. Now, what I think Americans don't often realize is they think that was the war, the Spanish-American War, but that's really just the tail end of this whole 30-year struggle for Cuban independence. So the Americans intervene, they win the war, and then they occupy Cuba. You know, there's an American governor of Cuba. It's a military occupation that lasts for four years. And through that occupation, policies are put in place that really favor American investment in the island. And the fact that the U.S. leaves in 1902, only after Cubans agree to accept something called the Platt Amendment, which gives the U.S. the right to intervene militarily in Cuba. So in some sense, that establishes a system where the U.S. says, we will also be protecting your investment. We are making it easier for you to buy land. That's what they did during the occupation. And now with this Platt Amendment, we will protect those investments. So in the early 20th century, you have the massive entry of American capital and American companies buying up land. You have American banks taking over Cuban banks. And so there's that relationship. But again, it's never an equal or even relationship. And one of the things I talk about in the book is how there's this shared history going back to the American Revolution or even before, right, to the British siege and so on. There's this shared history, but a lot of times, and especially for this history of the Spanish-American War and Cuban independence, there's a shared history, but there's not a shared vision of that history. So for a long time, an American statesman would say this, and they said it even like when Fidel Castro came to power, they said, we gave them their independence. We helped them win their independence. And they're being ungrateful. How could they go to communism when we gave them their independence, right? And Cubans always, from the beginning, were, no, you didn't give us our independence. There was a very important book published in Cuba in 1950. The title of the book was, Cuba Does Not Owe Its Independence to the United States. Very blunt title. So that's what I mean. There's two different ways to look at that same moment. For Cubans, that moment where the American intervenes at the end of the 19th century is the moment in which the Cubans had almost already won the war. The U.S. comes in, the U.S. wins, they take credit for Cuban independence, and then expect Cuba to be grateful. And they see it more as theft than as gift. We can really tell from our conversation that the United States, and even as you pointed out, British North America, had this very long history with Cuba. Their relations, their trade, and often their ideas were intertwined with each other. Otta, what do you think is the one thing that would really surprise us or that would really expand our knowledge of early American history if we were to better integrate this intertwined history between the United States and North America into our understanding of early American history? I think there's a couple of ways to answer that. One way is that when you include Cuba in the story, it makes it easier to see how empire was a part of the American Republic from the beginning. I mean, I'm not a historian of the U.S., so I think people have written about that in relation to indigenous Americans and Native Americans and territorial expansion and dispossession and so on. But they still keep that within a national frame, perhaps. And I feel like if you make Cuba part of the story and make U.S. interest in Cuba a part of the story, it lets you see how empire was foundational as slavery and as native dispossession, right? that, that desire to acquire more land and acquire more influence and in more places for commerce. And the fact that slavery was the linchpin of that connection to Cuba I think maybe provides a yeah, more expansive view of the U.S. role in the world, perhaps. We should move into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. 
just discussed how Cuba almost joined the United States. Ada, in your opinion, what might have happened if Cuba had joined the United States, either as one or three states, during the 19th century? How do you think the histories of both Cuba and the United States might be different? Wow. (laughs) Everything is contingent on everything else, right? So it's hard to know what the ultimate outcome would be. For example, could the acquisition of Cuba meant that the sectional conflict would have played out completely differently and that the South wouldn't have felt like they had to secede to protect slavery? Or if they did feel they had to secede, could they have won with that much more slave territory to protect? If they had acquired it earlier, would that have made a difference in how parts of the United States was incorporated and the way decisions about slavery in those territories would have happened? One would think it would have affected that, but I'm not quite sure how. Because again, one thing depends on the other. So that's one thing. It might have resulted in a completely different history in the U.S. in relation to slavery, secession, and westward expansion. So that's pretty big. And then the other thing that I wonder is what it would have meant for Cuban independence. Like, would the Cubans have been happy to no longer be Spanish? And would that have been enough? Or would there have been a movement against the United States and independence for the United States? But I'm a historian. (laughs) So, yes, that's as far as I'll go. As you said, everything is contingent. And this question probably has more contingencies in it than others. But, you know, I needed to ask. Right. Because if this changes and this might change and this might, you know, it's kind of hard to pinpoint it. But I do think that it opens up the possibility for a completely different history of slavery in the U.S. Swata, where do you go from here? You've written your new book, Cuba and American History. What is your research and writing about now? Do you have a new research project in the works? I just finished this and I've been doing all these events related to it. I have a few ideas for new projects, but I haven't decided. So one may be to go back to one of these major slave conspiracy rebellions and the one led by José Antonio Ponte, who was also an artist and an intellectual and in some ways a historian, I think, and write about him and that movement and his work. That's one possibility. Another possibility is to focus on precisely this period that we're talking about, this middle 19th century where the connection with the U.S. becomes so influential and so determinative. And my first book had to do with the Cuban independence period, and my second book had to do with the period of the Haitian Revolution. So I imagine it as the middle book in a trilogy. And that would be a book in which the U.S. would also necessarily go very large. So that's another possibility. Where can we find more information about you and how we can contact you if we have any more questions about the history of Cuba? Well, I've got a website, outofferrer.net, and you can contact me there and read more about, you know, other work and other projects I've been doing, and also on my page on the NYU History Department website. Otto Ferrer, thank you for taking us through the early history of Cuba and its relationship with the early United States. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Cuba's geographic placement in the Caribbean Sea at the mouth of the Gulf of Mexico helped get the island its nickname key to the Indies. From Cuba, travelers could sail anywhere within the Caribbean and to the Americas. This is in part why Cuba developed into a commercial hub for trade and travel. Now, we often forget that hard money, gold and silver coins, were not something that were readily available in North America and sometimes even in Europe. This made trade with Cuba important. Cuba was a place where American and European traders could sail to and find hard cash if they managed to time their visits with the arrival of the Mexican treasure ships bound for Spain. Of course, the periodic presence of the Mexican or Spanish treasure ships also made Cuba a target for pirate attacks. As Otto described, these attacks could be horrific and violent affairs, which made it necessary for large and beautiful fortifications to be built around the harbors of Havana and Santiago. Now, these fortifications didn't always stop foreign attacks. In 1762, the British successfully laid siege to Havana and captured the island. During their 10-month rule, Great Britain opened the ports of Cuba to more free trade with different Caribbean islands as well as with British North America. This initial trade with British North America paved the way for closer ties between Cuba and what would soon become the United States. Now, as we heard from Ada, 
This was a relationship that included trade, slavery, and talks about whether to bring Cuba into the American Union as three new slaveholding states. In the end, Cubans opted to remain part of Spain until claiming and achieving their own independence in 1898. Now, when we look at the history of Cuba within the history of early North America and the early United States, we can really see how ideas of empire drove the early American Republic right from the start. Early Americans didn't just want to possess and command all North American lands from sea to shining sea. No, Americans desired to recreate part of the imperial experience that it had left behind with the American Revolution. And looking at this shared history between Cuba and the early United States allows us to see this ambition quite clearly. Look for more information about Ada, her book, Cuba and American History, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 319. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. This episode of Ben Franklin's World is supported by an American Rescue Plan grant to the Alejandro Institute from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Alejandro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Jessica Brabble, Martha Howard, and Holly White. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, you have been telling me that you want to know more about how the history of the Caribbean connects with the history of early America. So what more would you like to know? Tell me, Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.